Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Michael Sony. I am the director of the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, and we are very pleased to be hosting this uh, uh, afternoon of conversation with uh, Jane Sun, uh, together with the Harvard Global Health Institute, the uh, Greater China Club at HBS, and the Harvard College China Forum. Uh, the format for today is uh, as follows. Um, Jane will make a few opening remarks uh, uh, about some of the things that she is passionate about. And uh, then I'll uh, ask her some questions to get a discussion going. And then I'll try to leave as much time as I can for uh, questions from you, uh, the audience, uh, to give you a chance to engage with, with Jane. Um, when we get to the questions, it's a, it's, a, it's a big room. We have mics that will be run around. So put up your hand, and I'm sure you can choose you can choose who, who gets to ask questions, right? Uh, and then just wait to make sure that a mic gets handed to you before you speak. Um, so let me just make a few quick words, a very brief introduction. I'm sure many of you know uh, Jane Sun by reputation. Uh, she is the CEO of Ctrip, the largest online travel agency, the long, sorry, the largest online travel agency in China and one of the leading travel service providers in the world. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from the business school at the University of Florida and an LM degree from the University of, uh, of Peking University Law School. She was named in 2019 uh, as one of Fortune's top 50 most powerful women in business. In 2017, she was recognized as one of the most influential and outstanding businesswomen by Forbes China. As a consistent advocate of gender equality in the workplace, She's encouraged CTRIP's female employees to take leadership roles in the company. Uh, under her uh, leadership as CEO, uh, women now make up one third of the company's high level executives and over half of its employees. Uh, one of the things for which Jane is, is uh, well known in the business world is that in addition to promoting women to leadership positions, she's also done uh, a great deal to um, facilitate the uh, women's uh, place in the workplace for example, by uh, providing financial assistance for um, uh, um, family planning uh, and fertility uh, treatments, and by reimbursing taxi fees for um, uh, uh, pregnant employees. Uh, she's been a great supporter of a wonderful initiative at Harvard that I think she will talk about. And if she doesn't, I will ask her about it uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Jane Sun. Thanks, Professor, and thank you very much for coming uh, at the end of the day. I'm excited to see you. Uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction of myself. Um, I was born in Shanghai and went to Peking University Law School. At my sophomore year, uh, one of the professors from the University of Florida wanted to select one student to come to the States to study. So I was very blessed for the opportunity to come uh, and join the, one of the first batch of the Chinese students to come to the United States to study. But at that time, China was very backward. Uh, my parents were both chemistry engineers, but they made 100 RMB per month, which is equivalent to 15 USD per month. So when I came to the States, I had to work in the restaurant as a waitress, making $3 per hour to support myself, to make the tuition paid. Uh, so after my, I made all the tuition um, paid, uh, I left nothing. Uh, but my professor were very kind to me. They uh, took me home as their own children and treated me as their own daughter. Uh, so as a good Chinese kids, the Confucian's teaching is that when you are young, your parents take good care of you. But when your parents are older, you're supposed to take good care of your parents. So I told my professor's family that when I grow up, when I'm able to, I wanted to take good care of them. Uh, so, but they told me, oh, honey, you don't need to take care of us. Instead, if you can take care, support, the international students, in a way, we help you, will be very happy. 
So I was very, very touched. Um, although I was penniless uh, when I studied in the university, I always had a big dream that someday, if I'm able to, I wanted to establish a scholarship named after my professor to support the international students who work so hard to be successful. Uh, at that time, it looked so far away. It's just like a very vague dream for me. But that, that dream always inspired me. Uh, so I was very glad in 2016, I went back to my university and established a scholarship named after my professors um, who helped me so much and changed my life. Um, uh, so after I graduated from university, I went to the Silicon Valley uh, to work there. Uh, and I, uh, my husband joined Yahoo in, 20, in 1996 uh, with Jerry Young and David Philo uh, in 1996 before their IPO. Um, and he invented the first uh, search engine of Yahoo and hold a patent uh, for Yahoo. And in 2000, we got a phone call from a very good friend of ours and from a very small company. And that company is called Alibaba. <laughs> and that good friend is, is Jack Ma. Um, so it, at that time, Yahoo was a rural zone tennis. The stock hit 200 to 300 USD per, dollar, per share. But uh, John, you know, all of a sudden, decided to join this company with only 20 to 30 people in Hangzhou. So he started to commute between uh, Silicon Valley and Hangzhou. In 2000, uh, 2005, C-Triple was looking for a CFO. So when the board came to talk to me, John and I thought it's a great opportunity for our children to study Chinese and find their tradition and the heritage. So we moved our family back to China. So at that time, Sichuan was very small. Uh, a lot of people don't know what Sichuan was doing. So every quarter after the earnings call, I would jump on the plane, land in San Francisco at 8 o'clock, take a shower, one day road show, and then red eye to Boston, one day road show, two days in New York, and then to, uh, to London, to Edinburgh. So I keep on doing you know, the road shows and try to let the investors understand what Chinese travel industry is, what CTRIP does. So gradually, CTRIP built a very good uh, reputation in the investment community. And when I was a CFO, I was also running a lot of operation because the company was growing three digits every year. There were lots of things that needs to be fixed, needs to be uh, improved on. So gradually, our board promoted me to be a COO, and then president, and then CEO of the company. So I always feel very blessed for the opportunity I have, and uh, much is given, much is expected. So I feel tremendous responsibility to grow the next generation of the leadership. And also, as the only female in a major internet company, I also feel tremendous responsibility to bring up and inspire the next generation for female leadership. So for CCCCCC, we do quite a lot to encourage the uh, female le leadership. So when China had this one-child policy, when our employee decided to have the second child or the third child, they will be penalized by having to pay a very hefty penalty. <laughs> so I would write a check to non-interest bearing loan to our employee for them to pay off the penalty. Uh, at that time, it was a little bit uh, tricky because that's a strong statement uh, that we are not in agreement with the one child policy. But uh, now I think uh, fortunately the government was very wise to reverse the policy. So now we have two child policy, two children policy. We still don't think that's enough. So what CTRIP <laughs> does is when a female is pregnant, we give them taxi, reimburse them for taxi fee. When they come back to work, we offer flexible working hours for them. When the baby is born, we give them 800 as a gift, 3,000 as an education fee. And 
Very recently, I noticed lots of female employees start to get their PhDs, uh, doctor's degrees overseas. So when they come back home, the birth period is shortened. A lot of them start to struggle, whether I have family first or work first and children first. So instead of seeing them struggling to make a tough choice, if they want to have their eggs freeze, eggs frozen, c will pay for it. Uh, and that's very progressive. c is the number one company and the only company who does that. So uh, from adopting so many uh, female-friendly policy, uh, c -trip's workforce, more than 50% of the workforce are females, more than 40% of the middle management uh, are females, and more than one third of the executives are females. And I would like to see more and more females to grow up taking uh, more responsibility uh, to help the company to grow and promote uh, gender equality and female <coughs> leadership. And I think uh, being a working mother uh, is the best role model for my two young daughters. So they can also have a work-life balance going forward. So that's a very general introduction of myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So you've, you, you began, thank you, Jane, for that, that wonderful introduction to you and your career and your, and your, uh, and your concerns and your passions. Um, we hear a lot about, so you mentioned some of the things you are doing at CTRIP um, to promote gender equality in the workplace. We hear a lot about uh, the underrepresentation of women in the internet industry. Can you say something about your own experiences mm. uh, making your way through a male-dominated profession? Yeah, sure. Um, when I first joined CTRIP, I led our executive team to uh, the, another Asian country. Uh, we were trying to do some exchange with that company. Uh, when I walk in, uh, our chairman was very young, so the counterpart bowed very polite. And then the second person is another founder, Bao Bao Bao. I was number three walking into the room. Everyone thought I was the secretary for our chairman. And they turn around and walk away without even greet me. So when we sit down in the room, we were introducing ourselves to our partners. They, they feel very bad because they didn't inten intentionally to hurt me. But in their mind, having a female young CFO at that time was just unforeseeable. So they were very surprised to see me as a female leader uh, in the team. Uh, that makes me think how rare it is in high industry, high tech industry, a female leadership is very important. But if you look at Harvard, MIT, uh, MIT is an exception, Harvard, Yale, you know, <laughs> <laughs> universities, I think lots of uh, students are females. And, Females are just doing very well in the university. Why they are not excelling in the workplace is always something that bothers me. So to give you an example, one time, we, every quarter we have off-site executive meetings. And one time, one of my staff was breastfeeding her baby. And I told her that to bring her baby with us. So during the meeting break, she can run to her room, feed the baby, and come back again. Because I, as a working mother, I know how important it is to breastfeed your baby. And if you stop breastfeeding your baby for one day, the milk will disappear. And uh, by offering uh, to have her baby to come along with us, c -trip didn't sacrifice anything. But it's a huge support for her family, for her baby, for her. And we develop a strong loyalty and appreciation from the employee to CTRIP. So I think having a senior leader on the executive team, on the board, making the team be aware of the issues that is encountered by females day in and day out is very helpful. A lot of male leaders, it's not that they are not supporting females. They don't know, right? They haven't experienced that. So that's why I feel tremendous 
responsibility to promote leadership team, having more female representatives on the board, on the executive team, so their voice, their concerns can be addressed. Thank you. Um, that's a, a nice pivot to the next question I want to ask you, which has to do with your philanthropy. Mm. Um, uh, about two years ago, um, Harvard uh, established a fellowship to elevate, promote, and educate uh, young female leaders in global health, mm. and you took it upon yourself to support the entire first cohort mm. uh, of fellows in this program uh, for women leaders from India, Malawi, uh, Moldova and, and Pakistan, mm. um, for which uh, uh, they and, and Harvard as well are very grateful. Can you say something about what drives your philanthropic decisions? Was there a moment or a moment in your life when you thought um, women and women's leadership was going to be the focus of your philanthropy? Uh, how do you? How did you come to that decision? Yeah, sure. Um, in China, there is saying that if you help a boy you help one person. If you help a girl, you help the whole family, the whole community, and maybe the whole country. Uh, so having tried to help females, in my mind, will not only help individuals, but also help the whole community for the whole family. So that's very important for me. The second thing is I also wanted uh, to find some shared interest uh, between countries, and particularly during this turbulent time, I think it's very critical for us to maximize our shared interest. And public health is something that is universal. No matter you're from China, from USA, from Africa, Pakistan, Europe, everyone is concerned about public health. So I was trying very hard to find a, something that is draw attention and share, let us share the common interest uh, for human being. Uh, and when public school, Natalie and Ahishi uh, come to me, I thought that's something we can work on to let people know, although we have differences, but if we focus on our shared interest and try to maximize our shared interest and respect each other's difference, we can do so much together. Uh, so that's another reason why we, I wanted to support this program. And the third thing is also as a female leader, I always encourage our staff to be brave and go out of your comfort zone. And for me, my career is mainly in high tech, in travel industry. I feel comfortable when I talk about high tech industry and uh, high tech. But healthcare is something new. So through this project, I'm hoping I can also learn from our wonderful fellows um, to showcase that even as a CEO, I have to push myself to go out of my comfort zone, get into the field that is keep me going, keep my learning spirit high every day. So these are the three reasons why I feel very important to support this program. Thank you. Well, I feel like I ought to push you further out of your comfort zone, but I think the audience may want to hear something about stuff that's in your comfort zone. So maybe let's turn to business questions for a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. You, you mentioned the, the turbulent uh, US-China relationship, and mm -hmm. we had a very uh, wonderful conversation over the last uh, hour or so about US-China relations. I wonder if you could say a couple of things uh, about uh, your thoughts about the current turmoil, uh, how it is affecting your business, mm -hmm. how it is affecting Sea Trip. What do you think the long-term impact? Uh, we don't know, of course, whether Liu He and 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 uh, will make a deal in the next couple of weeks. But uh, what do you think the long-term fallout of this turbulent uh, period is going to be, mm -hmm. both on Sea Trip and your own work, uh, the situation in the Chinese economy mm -hmm. and the larger U.S.-China relationship? Mm. Sure. Um, I think travel for me is one way to break these borders between nations and bring people together. Um, particularly during this uh, turbulent time, when we travel to each other, we will see the real China, real USA, right? When you look at the media, what makes the news are the negative things. For the people, I want to ask how many of you have been to China 
a lot of a lot of uh, people have been to China, but a lot of them do not have haven't been to China. <laughs> so the impression you get from China, these two students in the middle. <laughs> what's your impression if you use an uh, adjective for China? What's that? You're from China. Yeah. No, no, the two gentlemen. No, the two gentlemen here. Yeah. You didn't put up your hands. If you don't mind sharing. Uh, my father worked with uh, Ah. Big market uh -huh. and like opportunity to like, and like how China become like a really powerful technology country. Mm -hmm. They started copying things and now they're creating their own technology. Mm. So piracy, right? Intellectual piracy. <laughs> It's fair, it's fair. Yeah, how about you? My view is pretty much the same as his because we are from Brazil and we see how China uh, grew economically the last few decades. And yeah, we, we are in the same business, so it's pretty much the same. Mm. May I also have one person who are not born in China but have been to China and, and share your perspectives, your impression about China? Professor, maybe? The mic is here. Uh, actually, I, I feel a little bit blessed because your experience in the United States is what I was able to experience here at Harvard. They have a very, very strong program of mentoring uh, students, both undergraduates and graduate students and fellows. And so as a result of that and being involved in the mentoring program, uh, I've ended up going to China more than 20 times I had the pleasure of going to Hangzhou uh -huh. uh, and actually going to many, many different uh, parts of the country and been blessed to get to know a number of Chinese people. Mm. Professor, what's your impression, first impression about China? And what surprised you the most? Well, actually, it's the people. <laughs> uh, because if you listen to the mainstream media in the United States, you get an impression that uh, there's a, basically uh, Eventually, we're going to have a war between China and the United States. That's also true if you listen to some professors from uh, Harvard Graduate School, uh, <laughs> all the Kennedy School. Uh, <laughs> but, but the reality is what you said, namely, women have babies. And the most important thing in their life is to educate their child, give them the opportunity, such as you had, to come to the United States, participate in our educational system, and then hopefully go home. Mm -hmm. So the same is, is true. People in China are no different than Americans. They have children. They want them to aspire to improve and have a better life. Mm -hmm. And so in China, I know that the government officials' primary job is to create jobs for their people. Mm -hmm. They don't think about the United States. Their job is to think about the people and how they can improve their lives. Yeah. So, so it's always been a pleasure to speak to people throughout China, even though I don't speak the language. Uh -huh. You can communicate anyway with them. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, so that says how important travel is, right? So because in the news, what makes news are the negative information. When I thought about uh, Middle East, before my first trip to the Middle East, I, my impression of Middle East is very backwards. People, females cover their face, young people, the only people I have seen is in a movie, Hollywood movie, young people bomb, they set the plane, they, they bomb the plane. That's my impression of the Middle East. But when I went to Jordan, um, I saw how hospitable people are. Uh, their teaching is, if it's a stranger passing your home, you need to host them for three days, three nights, without asking any questions. And when I ask what they care about, it's exactly the same thing, Professor, you mentioned. They want their children to have good education, young people to have good career path, family to have good family, peaceful nation. Just the same thing as people in Brazil, in the United States, in China, in Middle East. So it's not an American dream, Chinese dream, Brazil dream. It's a dream for human beings. So for me, travel in this particular moment becomes a very good bridge between different countries and bring people together and promote global peace. 
That's why I want to put concerted efforts in this particular time to talk with the students, professors, uh, different leaders in different industries to let people see we share so much commonality. Our similarity is much more than difference. So that's the first thing. The second thing is also uh, through travel, I hope people can also understand uh, each other. I read a book, Any Good Relationship, no matter husband and wife, leader versus team members, if you have a good relationship, the overlapping similarity is 25%. 75% are individualism. We are all different, right? So for the world, it's also the same. It really, the 25% overlaps are the things we need to focus on rather than pointing at the 75%. The 75% difference make the world a wonderful place, a colorful place, a, not a boring place, but that the shared value we overlaps is the things we need to focus on. So, uh, Professor, I think you are doing tremendous work to promote China-US relationship, and I hope our uh, students in uh, Harvard can also take lots of leadership to promote a mutual understanding, not only between China and the US, but also all the other re regions, other uh, nations. I had a chance, I'm a member of ABC, Asia Business Council, and I have met two wonderful businessmen. One is Korea-bound Japanese, another one is Japan-bound Korean. They're good friends from a business perspective. They made a comment which is very insightful. He says, when the Korean president criticizes the Japanese government, his approval rate increases. And when the Japanese prime minister criticizes the Korean government, his approval rate also increases. But as a business person, they don't see any virtue in doing that because it's not for the best interests of these two nations. So I think um, as students here, who try to learn truth, uh, try to do the best and change the world in a positive way, we ought to go out of our way and see the real truth um, from our travel experience, from talking with different people. So I appreciate your taking time to listen to me today. Uh, hopefully, it will also give you some other perspectives other than what's on the news. Thank you. It's a very, uh, you, you, you obviously believe in the product you're selling, mm. um, which is- Very passionate <laughs> about it. <laughs> and I mean, you've, you've, you've almost uh, presented global travel as a solution to the problems facing the world. One um, of the solutions. One of the solutions. So that, th that's actually the next question I'd like to ask you a little bit about is um, you, you, uh, you're the largest online uh, uh, brand in China, um, but you've been trying to expand the business uh, internationally. Uh, making investments in places like India. Can you tell us a little bit about your long-term plans for C-TRIP? Sure. Uh, within C-TRIP, I feel it's very important to take the leadership in four elements. The first one is the investment in technology. Uh, in our company, we have 40,000 employees. 10,000 of them are engineers. So we hire lots of high talents from the Silicon Valley, our CTO was from the Silicon Valley. Um, the team is very strong in technology. So that's the first important thing we need to take leadership on. The second thing is the innovation of the product. And we do that through internally our Baby Tiger program. Uh, so the young employees in our company are encouraged to bring business plan, to submit business plan, to have new ideas. And we'll fund them by giving them fundings, CEO, CTO, and we give them a formula uh, by assigning a P ratio, PS ratio. Their compensation is tied to their internal valuation. Right? To give you an example, one of the business unit, uh, which I feel very proud of them, uh, have the CEO came to me and said, oh, Jane, I want to start this business. And I was like, what do you want to start? He goes, I want to start our train business. And I asked them how much investment it will require. And he goes, 
I need six people, two million RMB. And I ask, how do you prove you're successful or not? And he says, give me six months. If my daily transaction exceeded 10,000 per day by the end of the six months, you let me keep it. Otherwise, you shut me down. So on the spot, I said, deal. You got two million six people, go run with it. And it only took them one month for their daily transaction to exceed 10,000 per day. And last year, their transaction was 800 million per year, multi-billion business. And the CEO is only 26 years old. Right? So we have this internal incubation system, very vibrant, promote these uh, innovate new products. So I think the product innovation also is very important. The third thing is service element. We, have, we can serve 20 languages. Our service employees covers all time zones. When there is a tsunami in Japan, earthquake in Nepal, a shooting in Las Vegas, our team can reach out to our customers, talk to them, and then work with the hotels on the ground open up the rooms, providing hot mail, hot tower, and rescue them back to their home country the very next day. So service is also very important for us. And lastly is the branding. In China, we are called C-Trip, uh, Outside of China, our brand will be trip.com uh, to appeal, make it uh, much more easy to remember for our global brand. So if you have these leaderships in technology, service, product, and branding, I think it can take the company very long. Uh, so that's how we compete and provide value to our customers. Can you say more about um, persuading overseas customers to trust Trip.com? Mm. Trip.com is a very new brand. Uh, so in Japan, Korea, Singapore, Australia, we already have our footprint there. When we start our business, our market share is probably 0.001. Now in Korea, we're close to be 10%. In Singapore, close to be 8%. Very fast move. And next year, we will try to start uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, Europe, seven countries, uh, UK, France, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and Russia. And the way we did it is we made an investment in Skyscanner, which is a price comparison engine. Before CTRIP made the investment, their model is to redirect their traffic to other OTAs, other airlines. But after CTRIP made the investment, they will be able to, customers will be able to select a CTRIP, select a trip.com, make the booking on their website. So the conversion rate enhanced tremendously. We also made an investment in India because that's a very fast growing market, but yet it takes local talents to do it. So we made investment in the number one online travel company in India, and we will give them the API for our technology uh, for them to achieve synergy in that market. So you will not be caught by the flying pig <laughs> yeah, Alibaba, Alibaba, Alibaba has just has. branded, uh, has just yeah. entered the space and, is, and their brand is called, it has a very silly name in English yeah, called like, Fliggy. Fliggy. <laughs> uh, Feizu. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're not worried about uh, the competition from Alibaba. Yeah, they will always make some noise, but uh, if you focus on what are the core competitors you are, you will extend our leadership. Right. I'm just going to ask one more question, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Okay. Um, so um, you have 300 million users. Mm -hmm. You sold more than a billion tickets mm -hmm. and hotel rooms last year. Uh, you must have a lot of information. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of data. What can you, what, what are you, so two questions. What does that data tell you about where the Chinese economy is going, either specifically in relation to, to tourism or on travel or more broadly? Um, and then a more broad question, what are you doing with all that data? Mm. Uh, for Chinese traveler this year, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, USA showed a decline, but everywhere else still show a very health growth. Um, I think there are a couple of uh, important elements when people consider where to go. The first one is easiness of visa application. 
so visa-free countries always get lots of volume because Chinese travelers tend to be last-minute bookers. So if they have one day left, they will see, oh, what countries do not require Chinese uh, citizens to have a visa. So visa is very important. The second one is the direct flight. Whichever uh, cities have direct flight will attract lots of customers. And the third one is the hospitality of the country. Uh, Thailand is always attract lots of customers. Uh, Italy always have lots of customers. So these three elements are very, very important. Uh, with the data we have, uh, we want to make sure that the customers, when we send the product to our customers, we have millions of products. And for business travelers who press on time, I think we want to make sure uh, the inventory we send to them has strong reliability. They will not run into a situation the hotel rooms are sold out or air tickets are sold out, right? So that's the most important elements for our uh, team. And then uh, for students, for example, where they have limited budget, uh, the first thing they want to see is safety and also cleanness of the hotels. So the hotels probably will not be risk out, uh, but uh, holiday inns or something that is clean and in a safe neighborhood becomes very important. And with the data also, particularly for business traveler, for example, when you book uh, tickets, air tickets for, with us, when there is a typhoon or storm coming in, we immediately will push a high-speed railway tickets to you. And after that, we inform the hotel that the customer will be checking in three hours later. And we also tell the driver, uh, instead of picking them up from the airport, your customer now is in a high-speed railway station. So with C-Trip, because we offer this uh, comprehensive product, one-stop shopping platform, and make it easy for our customers to uh, really, one phone call, solve every needs they need during the trip. So that's a very important use for us to have the data available. Uh, I said I was going to ask one more question, but I lied. I'm going to just ask a very small question, and it comes out of your personal biography. I know a lot of the students in the room, uh, and I know that the students from China are facing a question that you faced in 2005, mm. which was whether to remain and build your career further. You had a very successful career in the United States, uh, or to head back to China. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you made that decision in ways sure. that might be helpful to students thinking about the same question? Sure, sure. So I uh, spent almost 20 years in the Silicon Valley. Uh, when I tried to decide where to go to for the next five, 10 years, I asked myself three questions. The first question is, which country, which region offers the best uh, growth, right? When I went to China, the GDP growth for China was about eight to 10%. US was growing about 2%. So obviously, a country with strong GDP growth will seek for talents. So when I returned to China, I was the first female CFO in the market. I, if I stay in the Silicon Valley, I could make CFO as well, but not until you know, all my other leaders retire. Uh, so maybe after I become 80 years old, oh, 60 years old, <laughs> I become CEO. But in China, I was in my 30s, so I become the CFO, right? So the first question is, which region offers you the growth potential? That's very important. The second thing is, which industry do you want to be in? Uh, if you select to be in gaming industry, alcohol, tobacco industry, the margin is much higher, right? And it's much easier to make money. But I would feel so guilty making money because you either hurt people's health or hurt the kids' mental health, right? I couldn't stand thinking I'm making money because I sacrificed somebody else's interest. So I couldn't. But travel is very green. Right? Everybody enjoys travel. They benefit from travel. So travel, I feel very passionate about travel. And the third thing is, once you decide you want to uh, be in China, be in travel industry, then which company in the travel industry has the best chance? And when I went there, I believe c has the best chance to excel. Uh, so for the students here, also you need to think, 
do you want to be a, a, a bridge between China and US? Which area need you the most? When I went to China, very few students have trained uh, with a bilingual, bicultural background. So China has, was lacking for that kind of talents. But in the USA, right, in relative terms, uh, the diversification is much better. Uh, so I feel I can add more value by being back, help C-Trip, and become a good bridge between these two countries. So for the students who are looking for future growth in your career, I think these are also important questions to ask. So you made the choice between being the first female CFO and the first 80-year-old CFO. <laughs> and you thought the first was the more important choice. Very interesting. All right, we have plenty of time left for questions. Um, I'll let Jane field them. Please uh, throw up your hands so we can get you uh, a microphone. Let me start here. I would like to ask you a uh, question comparing the work culture in Mm. 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 Chinese people really work hard. Um, 996 is for my staff. I work 7 11 7. So 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock, 7 days. Sunday when I'm negotiating a deal, it's 007. It's, it's uh, 24 hours, 7 days a week. But uh, for very, very little money, Chinese people are willing to put in lots of hours to make, make it work, right? So when I was in Europe, I tried to do some kayak, 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then they said, oh, it's, you know, office hour is gone, you know, the <laughs> 4, 4 p.m. Nobody wants to take the money to, to host us. But in China, as long as you have money, oh, not only 4 p.m., 12 a.m., midnight, they will do it, you know. So people are very... Uh, hardworking for very teeny little money, minimum wage. They are willing to wash dishes, clean clothes. So the hardworking spirit in China is is really important. So Kaifu is right. Nine nine six is uh, quite common in the high tech industry. Um, in in the uh, try to manage the company, Citra uh, probably is. Uh, uh, mix of Chinese culture versus American culture. Because James Liang, our chairman and founder, was from Oracle in the Silicon Valley. I was from the Silicon Valley. So we know the local market very well. But meanwhile, our culture is very westernized. So for example, when a professor is teaching a class in, uh, in C-Trip, normally in a normal Chinese company, a professor within five minutes will know who is the leader in the company. Because once somebody says something, if the leader says this is right, everybody try to be agreement. But in CTRIPLE, we take pride for staff to challenge chairman and CEO. They, they feel very proud mm, to, to debate with you. And when we get on the, air, uh, the elevator during the rush hours, a normal Chinese company, when the chairman comes, CEO comes, the staff will let CEO, chairman, going first. Not in C trip, you know. They were like, wait, 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 wait. You have a car. Let us go into the elevator first. <laughs> so, <laughs> so normally I end up climbing up the tenth floor stairs instead of riding um, in the elevator. So we try to create a, a culture that's very equal. Uh, young employees are encouraged to talk at very equal foot. Uh, with the CEOs, uh, with the leaders in the company. Uh, so that's the culture for C-Trip. But the, obviously, you have different companies and different culture. But uh, I think what stands out really is uh, how the working spirit uh, for Chinese companies. But Michael Morris, who is the founding partner in Sequoia, wrote an article similar to Kai Fu. 
He says, Silicon Valley engineers need to learn from Chinese engineers working 996. And he was so beaten up by the, by the mediums. Like, what are you talking about? You know, we are not a communist country or whatever. <laughs> but it's nothing to do with communist country. It's just the work ethics, I think, because Chinese students were trained very young on to work very hard in order to get admitted to top universities. My classmates' kids, when they were in grade seven, yeah, I'm looking, grade seven, the kid already finished physics in high school. And I'm like, how did you do that? He says, oh, I study physics and math on Saturday. I study uh, chemistry and English and Chinese on Sunday. So I said, do you take a rest? Uh, Weekends, he says, no, I enjoy studying. You know, I don't feel so. They are very well trained, good or bad, right? I think it's not totally good. I think kids need to also give free time to think, to explore. But because of the Gaokao system, they are so well trained to be very hardworking. So work ethics is very strong in the workforce. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the um, hotel booking business of uh, Citrix. Um, so how do you think the appearance of Airbnb? Do you think uh, such a kind of um, sharing business can change the way people book hotels in the future? Thank mm -hmm. you. So how many of you prefer to stay in Airbnb? OK. Awesome. Good, good, good. Yeah. <coughs> so. So uh, what we feel, we see, trip, see Airbnb type of stay as a good alternative stay. So in China, the largest Airbnb type of stay is established by Sea Trip. It's one of our baby tiger program. Tujia is the largest alternative stay business in China. And Sea Trip is the main founder of this business. Outside of China, Airbnb is much bigger. Um, so I think there is a very uh, specific segment of the travelers enjoys Airbnb. Um, uh, students like Airbnb, and then a lot of uh, culturally curious uh, travelers likes to have an interaction with the uh, host uh, to talk with them, understand the culture. And then the third segment is if you have a big house, lots of families prefer to have an Airbnb product. Um, but there is also another segment that do not like Airbnb type of uh, stay, particularly for business travelers, because they need to make sure you have internet, close to the office, standard, standard services. Like my husband, I am very curious. I want to stay with Airbnb, right? And John is like, I leave my home to have a vacation. I'm just not going to stay in others' home to have my vacation. Mm -hmm. So very different. So I think there is a good segment that will enjoy and be good customers in Airbnb type of stay. But I think there is also another segment prefer hotel stay. Uh, both of them have some overlaps. Uh, for C Trip, we are very open-minded. All the Airbnb product are welcome to be listed on our platform. What do you think? Yeah, you. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but I think for the young generation, uh, meaning travelers um, prefer Airbnb. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Why? If What's if you use three adjectives for Airbnb products? What are the things attract you the most? Uh, I think you have more choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, variety, right? Yeah, and also, uh, yeah, like you said, what you said, um, living in Airbnb uh, houses can bring about a lot of culture, culture. experience. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think, uh, yeah, you can have. Um, I think that's the yeah major these are the yeah major um, advantages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my observation. 
<laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's a very good uh, input. Thank you. I think we have time for, for one more question. The gentleman in the back there. Thanks, Jim, for uh, coming in and sharing your perspective with us. Uh, I'm more interested on the personal side of you. Um, you mentioned you, you know, worked 7 11 7 uh, as a female CEO. Uh, how do you strike a balance between work and life? And I know you have two children, and what's your approach to uh, raise your kids as a woman CEO? Mm. Um. I, uh, I, I'm, first of all, I'm very blessed uh, for the Chinese tradition. Grandparents are very close to us. So we have two houses, and we build a corridor. We have dinner at the <laughs> grandparents' home. And, and when I'm traveling, my kids spend a lot of time with grandparents. Uh, so for my uh, female employees who also have a demanding work, uh, what, we, what I tell them is instead of having one house, on the east side, one house in the west side, try to sell both of them and buy two apartments in the same community so parents, grandparents can be close and take care of each other. So the network support is very important. Um, so for me, if I'm not traveling, I try to get to the office very early, like 7 o'clock I'm in the office. I work until maybe 7 o'clock. So that's already 12 hours. At 7 o'clock, I pack up all my work paper, stuff I need to read in the evening. But I try very hard to spend at least two hours, three hours with my family to have dinner. When they were young, I read them story. When they're in grade one, grade two, I help them with their homework. Now they are old enough. So when I'm working, they do their homework. But after, at around 9, 10 o'clock, they go back to work. Um, my but U.S. NASDAQ opens at 9. Europe is still in session. So my overseas call normally is scheduled late in the evening. That's the only way I can balance it out. Uh, it's not ideal, but, uh, but uh, I think uh, to be a working mother, I always feel you have two full-time jobs. Right? Being a mother, being a wife, it's a full-time job. Being a CEO is more than a full-time job. Uh, so you need to be prepared to invest twice as much as you choose one thing. But the good thing is you also are rewarded twice right? as a mother, as a wife, also as a career woman. Uh, so because I, my children are female, are, are two girls, and I think mothers are the best role models for their children. I cannot tell my kids, study hard to be independent, Meanwhile, I sit at home and watching TV, right? I want to show them being a working mother is challenging, but you can do it. So when they grow up, they have a choice. They can, they can elect to be stay at home, but they can also know uh, if they choose to be a working mother, there is a way to do it. Uh, so that's how I balance it out. When I'm traveling, I get lots of invitation from the leaders all over the world. And I cannot just come for one meeting, right? So I ask my assistant to keep a log. Uh, when I go to New York, there are 10 people I need to see. When I'm in Boston, there are eight people I need to see. So normally when I'm in a uh, travel mode, I normally take a red-eye flight to Europe. When I land, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. I take a shower, go immediately into my meeting. So one hour, 30 minutes, a meeting back to back. And if I can finish within one day, I take a flight back right away. If I need to you know, have two days, my meetings are very full, and I try to compress it very tightly. Uh, so to go to Beijing is the same thing. I take early flight, 7 o'clock to Beijing. When I land in Beijing, Beijing just is awake, 9 o'clock. And I work all the way until 10, take the last flight back. So that's how I arrange my schedule to be as efficient as possible. But it's, it's uh, physically very demanding. So I run marathon on the weekend. <laughs> so, <laughs> otherwise, you know, I cannot keep up with the world. But, but uh, yeah, so that's how I keep up with myself. 
I can't resist adding that you really should tell your daughters a third option, which is that they can, of course, marry stay-at-home husbands. <laughs> Uh, we are at time. Um, we, we need to stop. Uh, thank you so much, Jane, for sharing Beautiful your hat. life, your career, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, please come to visit us in Shanghai. I love to host, host you in our campus. Thank you. Right.